Good morning, friends. My name is Jennifer, and today I'm going to make Swiss cheese. I have made the baby Swiss before, loved it, made it a couple weeks ago, worked great, doing it again today. I already have four gallons of milk in the pot from today's milking. The pot is warm. It has not even been heated up, but this is warm, fresh milk. And I have more gallons over on the table that need to be added to the pot. Lots of cream. This baby Swiss recipe that I'm using is a mesophilic cheese. It only gets heated to 102 degrees. And the Jarlsberg cheese recipe that I follow is thermophilic. It goes up to 108. So the difference between the two is that Jarlsberg, the density of it is a, is a little tighter, more condensed, maybe a little bit more of that elasticiness. Because it is a higher temperature cheese, the moisture is less. The baby Swiss cheese, because it is lower temperature, it is just more moist, a little bit softer, a little bit lacier, not quite as durable or not tough. Tough is the wrong word, but you know, that tightness. Both cheeses are just supposed to be buttery flavored, nutty flavored and delicious. I'm gonna heat the milk to 84 degrees. Let it just sit. A note about propionic shimani. I was noticing that my Jarlsberg cheeses, anything that had propionic shimani and it was not getting the holes. So I contacted the company, they said, that propionic shimani actually expires fairly quickly. However, they do not put that expiration date on their packets. So you have to call them or email them, give them the lot number and they'll tell you the expiration date. So they sent me a new pack of propionic shimani. This one expires September 30, 2022. So this has expired. I have also heard people say that propionic shimani in the freezer will last longer than that. I just haven't gotten good holes since it has expired. I'm gonna use it again today, even though it has expired by half a year, the probiotic shimani still will give the cheese that Swissy flavor. It just might not get the holes. So I have made some interesting cheeses that taste like Swiss cheese, but do not have the texture of Swiss cheese, which is kind of fun. So we're just gonna go with it. It'll get the Swissy flavor in. We'll see if it makes holes or not. And I'm gonna give it, a, I make it a little bit rounded because it's probably weaker and because I can. I'm gonna let this just rehydrate for a minute while I get the clabber culture ready to go in. The other thing I'm using is my own clabber culture, which you can see how to make right here. It is fast becoming my favorite way to culture my cheeses. With clabber culture, it's a quarter cup per gallon of milk, so I would use eight quarter cups or two cups of this, which is a pint jar. So, so I do a little bit scant because raw milks, raw clabber, it's very strong culture. It's very alive. You don't need quite as much as you do with a freeze dried culture or pasteurized milk, which has been processed and the you know, the good bacterias are suppressed or killed. One other thing about this, I've had this going for a couple months now and I was just gone for eight days and my husband was in charge of it. He's supposed to feed it daily. And I just keep a little jar on the counter. He forgot, he did a fresh feeding, a fresh start about three times over the course of the eight days. It was very sour and stinky and then he would feed it and then it smelled buttery again. So I have learned that this can come back even when it's been like let out and kind of rotted too long. It's still, if you keep going it, at least in this case, it worked. Smells amazing, buttery, creamy, delicious. It'll just be kept going on the counter. Now this is gonna go into the milk. I hope it's good. This right here, you can drink, chill it, and it becomes creamy and smooth like a lassi, just a yogurt drink. Sweeten it with some maple syrup or sugar. I'm not doing this because I have so much other milk. I don't need more milky beverages, but I should taste it. Just make sure. I always get a little bit nervous. Yeah, it's fine. Tangy, liquidy, juicy, nice milk, cultured. And now I'm stirring this in with the propionic shimani, giving it a good stir. So it's totally incorporated. I'm gonna let this rest for 50 minutes to let it culture and ripen. And then we'll go on. It's one and a third teaspoons of rennet per eight gallons of milk. So it's two thirds teaspoon per four gallons of milk. This is less rennet than what you find in a Jarlsberg cheese, which has higher rennet and is a little bit of a harder cheese. Because I'm not quite at eight gallons of milk, I'm gonna do one and a quarter teaspoons. Also because my milk is raw, and that therefore it does not need quite as much rennet I have learned. It does well with a little bit less. Dilute it with a little bit of water. It's 
stir for between 30 and 45 seconds, definitely no more than a minute because the rennet will start to work. Once it starts to coagulate, you don't want to keep agitating it. So I can see right now it is starting to move slowly. There's a little bit more definition in the milk. It feels sludgy and that's when I'm starting to stop. I just do a little bit more at the top, hoping I got it mixed in well enough. And then you just gotta trust it. I'm gonna let this go for 45 minutes and then I'll come back. Oh, it looks a little bit loose to me, we'll see. Oh, maybe not. I like to guess and then see where I'm at. All right. It cut well, but it's... Uh, I'm gonna compromise. When the curd is fragile like this or not quite set, it just disintegrates faster and, and the good stuff comes out. It doesn't hold its shape as well. So you want it to be a firm set, but I don't want to go too long. So by working in stages, like I'm going to do columns right now, and then maybe I'll come back in five or 10 minutes later and do the side thingy and you break it down gradually. That allows it to continue to set up at the same time that you're, I don't know. I'm totally making this up. Let's just do it. Gonna let it sit for five minutes, then I'm gonna come back in and do it with a whisk. Gonna give it five more minutes to heal up and then I will come back and stir it for five minutes. I am now going to take off some of this whey at the top because it's just too hard to stir with it being this full. So I'm gonna just stir this for a little bit, break up extra big pieces that I find. It's a very light curd, feels super tender and soft. And I think most of the big chunks are broken up. So now it's just going to sit here for five minutes and settle. Now it's time to get the way out of the pot. You want to get a third of the way. This is fairly floaty curds. You can see through the bottom of the glass where they are. It's going to be slower this way, but that's okay. I'm just going to put this down in here. I'm going to use a smaller container and scoop that way. Bits of the curd are coming up through here, but it's not terrible. The other reason I'm going to make sure that I get a third of the way out and don't do too little is that it will take longer to heat this up if I have more liquid in here. So you want to make sure you really go down far enough or else your whole process just gets bogged down. That's probably about three gallons so far. The general idea is everything's in five minute increments. So I'm going to stir this for a little bit. I'm going to add 130 degree water over the course of five minutes, stirring constantly till it gets to 95 degrees. Then I'm going to stir it for about five minutes. Then I'm going to add more hot water to bring it up all the way to 102 degrees. And I'm going to stir it again. The pacing of it is in five minute increments. And the reason for that is you don't wanna go so fast that it heats this up too quickly, but you also don't wanna go slow because when you go slow, you're acidifying the cheese more and you don't wanna do that. So the five minutes is more of a guide for just like keep at it, keep going, don't go too fast. That's the process for this. That's the reason I'm going at this pace and it is specific to my type of cheese. You can be more exacting if you want. The recipe comes from New England cheese making. No, it doesn't, it comes from home cheese making and it's very specific in here, but I'm just gonna go by feel. I'm gonna stir this a little bit just to make sure it's all loose before I start adding the hot water. My water is 130 degree water. That's the temperature of my tap water. It feels much cooler on the bottom than on the top. So I'm just bringing that up and putting, pushing the heat down in. It's feeling more evenly warm. 91, pretty close. All right, it's 94 degrees and we have been going for almost four minutes. So now I'm gonna just stir this gently for five minutes, kind of let it stabilize and cook, cook through. I'm now ready to add more hot water and bring it up to 102 degrees. The level of this liquid is getting close to the point at which it was before. I wanna add the amount of water to equal the amount that I took away. So I think I will end up having to add more water to bring it up to 102 degrees. So I'm gonna use 140 degree water or a little bit warmer than what I was using before for this final raising of the temperature. I wouldn't have to, I could use 130 degrees, get it to as high as I can go, maybe it will only go to 99 or 100, and then I could turn on the burner and cook it if I wanted to instead. 
or I could take out some of this water and add more in at 130. There's many ways to do it, but you want to generally bring the level of liquid up to the amount that you took out and at the same time that you get it to arrive at the correct temperature. About 142. Setting the timer for five minutes. I'm gonna to try to raise it to 102 over that amount of time. The curds are moving very easily in this, so it's easier to incorporate the heat now that it's more liquid. Okay, we're right at 100, and I'm almost to the spot where I was, where the amount of curd was. So I'm going to try to take off some of this so I can add a little bit more hot water. Oh goodness, we're right at almost 101. I'm gonna just turn this on and heat it for a couple minutes. Okay, we're at 102 degrees. For the next 30 to 40 minutes, I'm going to just stand here and stir this off heat until these curds cook a little bit more. These are very fine curds. A lot of them are just like little crumbles already. There's a few little bigger ones, but mostly these are really small curds. I'm stirring with a spoon and I'm only stirring every couple minutes just to agitate a little bit because it's lunchtime and I am hungry and so I'm eating my sandwich, which is a leftover biscuit with ham and homemade grape jelly, mayonnaise, and homemade tom cheese. Lunch is over, and now I'm getting my hands back in the cheese pot. There's a few little clumps at the bottom, loose clumps. They haven't knitted together too well. So I'm just going through and making it all uniform again, each individual curd on its own as much as possible. They are feeling much more firm, rubbery, bouncy, hard. One thing I have noticed with cooking curds is I think the times in the books are often a little bit too long and my cheeses get a little bit dry. I'm learning to make the connection between the cheeses I like and how they felt when I was stirring them, which is a hard thing to do because you often don't remember back. But more and more, I'm realizing that the, the curds that aren't quite as hard make a cheese that is more pleasing, that is a, has a little bit more moisture content that just tastes better to me as opposed to the harder, drier cheeses. And maybe that's personal preference, or maybe raw milk cheeses don't need to be stirred as long. And if I follow the times in the book, that will make them become dry. I don't know. Take some curd and squeeze it. Does it hold its shape? Yeah, so I'm thinking this is done, even though it's been a fraction of the time that they say to go. These curds, because they're so small and tight, and because yeah, I don't know. They, just, they feel done to me. They feel dry. I'll go for another five minutes. I'll make it a full 20, but then I think it's going to probably be done. You can see how the curds are moving in here. It feels fairly empty. They feel fairly small and weightless, like there's not going to be much cheese. So you can see the extreme of size differences between the curds. They taste chewy, tender, not hard. Um, they squeak a little bit, but they're not horribly squeaky. They're just nice curds, and I'm going to squeeze it, and they hold their shape. I think they're done. I'm going to call it. I'm going to let these set for about five minutes and then I'll remove the whey down to the level of the curds. Yo, I can bust some moves. Listen, these curds are very loose and we don't want all the way to come out yet. So just be gentle. Stop. Put it back on the stove. I'll get another bucket. Stop. Let's give it the level. Yep. There we go. Have you fed the pigs yet? No. Okay, you need to do that. Bring the cows in, all that stuff now. Cows! He's calling the cows in because the vet is coming. They need to come up here because we're going to vaccinate Honey and Redbud. We're also going to see if Emma is pregnant. This is the curds, and they're level with the whey. What up next is to weight them down with a plate. Just take in a regular dinner plate. It says weight it down with two and a half pounds. I don't know what this is. This isn't a gallon eight pounds and this is a quart. So this is probably about two pounds. I don't know. And it's warm water. I'm just setting it right on top and letting that kind of help to consolidate. And this is going to sit here for 20 minutes. During this process, the curds are just acidifying in the whey. Wow, look at all that whey. This has really sunk down. These are the sheets of plastic. I got these from Amazon. I get a stack of these and then I cut them up into little squares and that's what I use to put on top of my camembert molds, my brie molds, whatever I need to flip. But the big pieces I use as a collar for when the curd may go above the edge of this mold because this holds an eight gallon milk cheese. So it will sink down, but sometimes it's way high and this just prevents from a big mess happening. I'll leave a link for this below the video if you are interested in getting some of these yourself. I made this 
cloth wet. You can use whey. You can spray this with vinegar water solution, 50-50. You can leave it dry too, but I find it, it works better to be a little bit wet. This is like a pancake on the bottom. It's very flat and compressed in here. I'm just gonna try to get it out and stick it in the mold with as little drama as possible. Like that. Woof. Okay, the curd is coming to about right here. So I'm just gonna let this sit for five minutes or so while I clean up. It'll hopefully have sunk down enough that I can easily fold it over and get it in the press. I'm gonna squeak here now. It's beginning to sink down just a little bit. So I'm going to pull these out. Voila. Still a little bit higher, but there's like a hole here. It's gonna settle in nicely. I try to get it down just inside the lip so it doesn't get caught on the edge as it's being pressed. For this pressing process, it's five hours of pressing time, more or less, low pressure, 10 to 20 pounds-ish, flipping every hour over the course of five hours. So it is one o'clock now. I'll kind of randomly do this off and on for the next few hours. That's it. And I'm just gonna give it 30 pounds, but that's pretty light pressure for right now. You can see a big gap right there. It's okay. It'll come together. So keeping this at low medium pressure, right around 25 pounds. And I'll come back in an hour or so. says it's supposed to stay in the press and go into cooler temps overnight. So I'm putting it back like this. And then this is gonna go down in the cheese fridge overnight. Pop it in there, 55 degrees stays cool. And then we'll brine it in the morning. That's all, bye. The cheese has been in the cheese cave. <gasps> My bread has risen. I gotta get that out. So now I'm getting it out and putting it in the salt brine. Seems pretty well knitted. Let's see how much it weighs. 7 pounds, 13 ounces. If you're brining roughly four hours per pound, that's going to be 28 hours-ish. I might do it a little bit less. No, shoot, I have to go into the middle of the night. 24 is at 10 o'clock. Yeah, I'll probably end up doing about 30 hours. The reason I'm hesitating on that, normally it doesn't matter if you go a little bit longer in the brine, it's just fine. But Propionic Shermani needs a less salted cheese. So I should have started this earlier today. Oh, well. I have had really good success with well-salted Jarlsberg cheeses. Propionic Shimani works just fine, and I have had cheeses that have not worked as well, and I wondered if it was because I had too much salt. I really think, in retrospect, it was because Propionic Shimani wasn't as strong, so I'm not sure how to figure that one out. You always want to salt the top surface that's exposed. And I could leave it like this the whole time and never flip it, but I usually flip it halfway through just to keep it even, but I've heard that it doesn't really matter one way or the other. You can see it's getting a little bit shiny because it's warm in here and the oils from the cheese are coming out. A little bit of moisture on that plate. So what I'm gonna do now, I'm putting a label on the plate. This is Baby Swiss, cheese number 142. Now it is gonna go down to the cheese cave for, it says two to four weeks. I'm going to do it for three weeks. So there it is. So I will flip it every few days over the next several weeks. This is the Swiss cheese. It has been down here in this cave. I've been flipping it. It's supposed to go up to room temperature for a month. And that's supposed to allow the gas to just make bigger bubbles. I don't quite think it's gonna work because I've had so much trouble, but I know the flavor should get developed. So now it's supposed to stay here for a month and I'll just keep flipping it. So the problem is, 
it's puffing a little bit. I don't know if you can see how it's round, like that's good, but I don't know if that's because of holes or just because this is the cheese. But can you see the butter on my hands? Oh, there, you can see butter on top. Because it's like 65 in that room, the butter is coming out, but it says to keep it at room temperature for a month, but you also don't want it to be swollen enough that the butter comes out. So I don't have any in between place. So I'm just gonna leave a buttery cheese sitting on the shelf and hopefully it won't dissolve into a mound of nothing. This baby Swiss is starting to expand. So I'll show you. Ah! Oh, it smells buttery. So here it is. Can you see how it's going up? This feels very firm. It smells good. It's buttery. Yeah, my hands are still greasy. Gonna flip it. And yep, the underside is all greasy, cheesy buttery. Can you see this? But it's expanding, which makes me very happy. Oh my goodness, I'm so buttery. So buttery. Butterfingers. <laughs> so I think it's working. I think it's expanding. And even though that butter's coming out, I'm not going to worry about it. I don't see it. It's not butter coming out. It's melted, buttery, dairy, fat. Butter. Most of butter, I guess. I swear it just fell off. Excuse me, I'm working. Oh, that's cheese spot, don't work there. All right, so here's the Swiss cheese. I left it in there at room temperature for an added week, unnecessarily. It doesn't seem to be leaking any more butter. That seems to be stable. It smells buttery. And my hands are greasy. And look at this. Can you see, can you see how that's all butter, like that one? That center one got all buttery. It's all crisply with butter. Yay, cheese butter. So the fun part about this cheese is that we get to cut it in half because it is so thick. In order to bag it, we're gonna have to cut it. So we're gonna get to see right now whether or not it has the whole structure that we hope it does. And I think this one does better than the other Baby Swiss that I did recently and the Jarlsbergs, which have been kind of flat. Just they have the flavor, but not the holes. I think this one might have the holes. And it does feel like there's holes inside. It feels a little bit airy. It looks exactly like a baby Swiss. Look at that. That is perfect. And it smells good. This only has another month until we have to, we can eat it. It smells really good. We could probably eat it now, but I'm not going to because it will get better. I mean, but that's a massively gorgeous, beautiful cheese. So for whatever reason, this worked. Maybe it's because it's clabber culture. Maybe that helps. I don't know. This one was supposed to be at room temperature until 6-9. Uh, oops, oh well. I did this too early. I said this wrong, friends. I got confused between two cheeses. This is supposed to be at room temp, this is supposed to be at room temp until a week and a half from now. And then it's supposed to be backpacked and cave aged at 55 for another month. Right now, I just backpacked it early. I'm just gonna put it back in the thingy over here and let it go at room temperature. I think it'll stay the same. I'll keep flipping it there and then we'll move it in a few more weeks, a couple more weeks. You can see it is busting open and it's bulging out right there. This bag seal did not stick, but it's good enough. I'm gonna let it keep going. I don't think there's any mold in there that I can see, but it is bulging even more. So I guess it's still swelling. It's supposed to be at room temperature for a little bit longer. It is time to open the baby Swiss. Let's go, get the cheese. <laughs> it's the baby Swiss and it is puffed up and it is time, time, time. This was made January, February, March, April. The end of April, it is now the middle of July. So it is like two and a half months old. When I sealed it, it puffed up more because I didn't finish letting it age at room temperature. I didn't fix the seal because I didn't see any mold growing on it. I decided, eh, I don't care. But if there had been mold growing on, I would have cleaned it off and repackaged it. And let's see the whole development. Oh, look. Okay, there is some mold right there, but that's like just white stuff. It's fine. 
it smells fabulous. It smells so good. And you can see that it's mushed because I mushed it. If it had not been bagged and not like that, like squished, it, the whole development would be more upright. But let's cut into this. Let's see, like right there. Oh, that's gorgeous. That's so pretty. So beautiful. That's so beautiful. Let's taste this. I'm going to get some of the rind and some of the inside. This is the chiz. And it is lovely. So the in very inside part. <laughs> that's so fine that is so fine it's buttery it's cream not creamy it's like that rubbery elasticiness but it's like smooth and perfect amount of salt has that swissy flavor that delicious swissy flavor and it's mild it's not too sharp mm, and it's it is soft it's not creamy but it's soft the laciness on the tongue is a lightness Let's taste the rind It's perfect. It just has more of a bite to it, but there's no weird flavor. Like it dries out a little bit. So there's a little bit more of a chew, like a little bit more denseness, but it's, it's delicious. This is really, really good. Mm, 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 mm. This is a clobber cheese. It's wildly good. Wildly good. This baby Swiss recipe, make it like this one. Wow. So good. I don't think it's a strong Swissy flavor. Like you could feed it to kids and family and they're going to like it. People who say they're adverse to Swiss cheese or something, I think this would be pleasing. Like it's not strong. It's still baby. I mean, it's baby Swiss. You can see how that like that bulge right there where it was pressed in against and then it just kept growing. So I think I just should have left it out for that extra week or two at room temperature. And maybe then I wouldn't have had it expanding weirdly in the bag, but maybe still it would have. I don't know. It didn't seem to hurt it at all. This is where you can see the mold right there, but that's like white mold. And I could just wipe that off with vinegar or salt solution or just even water if I wanted to. I'm not going to worry about that right now, but that's the inside. Beautiful, shiny holes, beautiful, beautiful cheese. Here's a cross section. Ha, huh, this looks prettier when you cut it this way. Look at how that looks. See how much prettier that is. So that one shows because it was smushed, but this way it expanded more fully. So it's just how you want to showcase it. Well, you have to hold it up to your face because I have to back really far up. Mm -hmm. I want you to notice the difference between cross sections. So when I cut the wheel up and down, you can see how the holes are thin, like they look smushed. But when you do a cross section and cut the cheese like that, this is what you get. You can see perfectly round, shiny holes. It depends on how you cut the cheese. So when you see it smushy and flat like that, smushy and flat like that, don't be alarmed. Cut it this way and see what you get. It's beautiful. I'm going to backpack them in little bags, stick them away. We'll have them for a long time. These are going to the fridge out in the barn. Some of these are going to the basement. Some of these are going to my fridge to be eaten right away. Some of these packs didn't quite steal, so I'm going to put them in my basement fridge where our family uses them. And then the rest are out in the barn.